Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I'm Reverend Melanie Kirk Hall, and it's my joy and honor to be with you today. This month begins the celebration of Asian, Asian History Month. Officially recognized in Canada since 2002, it's a time to prayerfully reflect on the contribution of Asian Canadians to Canadian society. In light of the recent surge in anti-Asian racist events, we felt it was important to honor this time of celebrating all Asian members within our United Church. We certainly would be a lesser denomination without their leadership, service, and fellowship. I commend you to the Asian History uh, resources on the United Church of Canada website if you're wanting more information, knowledge, and appreciation during this special month. And now, as we move into worship, we begin today by acknowledging the history, spirituality, culture, and stewardship of the land of the Amjanong First Nation. We seek to live in respect, peace, and right relations with them as we live, work, and worship upon their traditional territory. We are mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. And so as we move into this time of worship, let us remember that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Let us light our Christ candle. We light the Christ candle. Now let us join in our call to worship. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we ought to love one another. If we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us. So come, worship our God, who is love. And let us join our hearts together in the prayer of approach. Let us pray. Author of life, you have written love into the beginning of our stories. You have written love into the blood that flows in our veins, into our very DNA. For we are made in your image, and you are love. There are times when we have strayed from the story you intended for us. So help us to find our way back. Open our hearts to love more deeply. Open our minds to seek your wisdom and to grow beyond what we know. Open our lives to recognize that your beloved community is beyond the people of our family union, beyond our friends, our neighbors, and our churches, but it is the whole world. Help us to live into the ways that sustain and nourish this planet and all your children, and remind us that you are the author of our lives, in whom we find our beginning and our ending. This we pray in saying the words that Jesus taught his friends to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is Voices United 165, Come You Faithful.
now let us join our hearts together in prayer before we hear the words of Scripture. Eternal God, in the reading of the Scriptures, may your word be heard. In the meditation of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 12 and 18 to 21. It all begins with God's love. In case we ever forget this basic, essential fact of our faith, 1 John makes it crystal clear. God is the source and the definition of love. God's love is not some abstract concept. It is passion expressed in action. God made love real and present by sending Jesus to live among us. God continues to show us love through Jesus' life-giving presence among us. If ever we should question whether God truly does love us, the gift and witness of the Holy Spirit confirmed it once more. We are God's beloved. God's love is a truth more basic and reliable than the ground we walk on and the air we breathe. God is love. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters, are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. This is the witness of the early church. Thanks be to God for the word. Our responsive psalm this morning is Psalm 22, found in Voices United, page 746, reading parts 3 and 4. Give praise, all you who fear God. Proclaim God's greatness, all you children of Jacob. Stand in awe, all you children of Israel. For God has neither despised nor scorned the poor in their distress. You, O God, have not hidden your face from them. You heard them when they called to you. You are the theme of my praise in the great assembly. I will keep my promise in the presence of those who fear you. Let the poor eat to satisfaction. Let those who seek you praise you. May they be in good heart forever. Let all the ends of the earth remember and turn to you, O God. Let all the families of the nations bow down before you. For yours is the dominion, O God. For you rule over the nations. Even all who sleep in the grave shall worship you. Those who go down into the dust shall bow before you. I too shall live for you. Our children shall serve you and tell generations yet to come about you. To a people yet unborn, they shall make known the saving deeds you have done. Our second scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, reading in the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 8. This week's image of the vine is an extended metaphor which borrows from and adapts Old Testament imagery for Israel. The vine was a common image used to speak of Israel as God's people and conveyed the ideas of divine love and divine judgment. John masterfully plays with the symbolism of this image. The vine grower is still God, 
but the vine is now Jesus. And the branches that are part of the vine, that is part of Jesus' mystical body, we are them. We are those branches, the hands of Christ in the world. The secret to be a productive branch is to stay attached to the vine, to be in relationship with Jesus and his community. Let's hear the words of Jesus, the true vine. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Praise to Christ the Word. Our next hymn this morning is Voices United 291, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Thing happened when Scott first started coming to family events. There was a shift in power. You see, whenever my immediate family would get together, side conversations of huddles would happen, divided by what your day job was. My mom and I would talk church in one corner, and my dad would chat with my sister about tech and computers, and my brother, who works in tech but knows church world, would sort of be able to float between the two conversations. But when Scott came, the balance shifted. Suddenly, my mom and I were radically outnumbered. Quickly, shorthand terms and industry talk would fly around, and I would find myself wondering if they were all talking Greek. But church world can be just as confusing, come to think of it. Why, even Jesus, with his I am statements, uses a metaphor to explain who he is, and that needs some unpacking. That's because Jesus is using imageries that spoke to the people of his day, not necessarily our time. Images like shepherd and sheep, if you were with us last week, or this week's vine and branch metaphor. Jesus chose the image of the vine specifically because it spoke to his listeners. They would have understood just as a person, say, from southwestern Ontario might know about farming or northern Ontario about mining and milling. It doesn't matter whether or not you were in that business, you grew up around it enough that you would still be familiar with it. A vineyard was also the symbol of the nation of Judah. 
Over and over again in the Old Testament, Israel is pictured as a vine or the vineyard of God. So with that in mind, let's imagine Jesus holding up a grapevine as he says thoughtfully to the people, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. It's a beautiful illustration, but what is he saying? To some, it might seem straightforward. Jesus is the vine, God's the gardener, and we who follow Jesus are the branches, and our task is to bear fruit. And sometimes, according to this passage, God prunes us to make us more faithful. And there have been many faithful sermons that focus on that tough aspect of pruning that we will all face. In fact, when I looked back at the last time I preached on this passage, that's exactly how I tackled it. But I think it's good, and and it is a good, important aspect for us to focus on. But I also suspect that we've all already heard that sermon. And that in these days, perhaps we need to hear another element lifted. And funnily enough, it comes back to speaking Greek. Did you know that Bible scholars tell us that the Greek phrase for he prunes can also be translated to mean he cleans? Let's read the passage again, substituting cleans for wherever prunes is. Jesus says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he cleans, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. It changes it, doesn't it? Just by inserting a different faithful translation, it offers a different message, doesn't it? Jesus says that every branch that does bear fruit, he cleans so that it will be more fruitful. But now we have to dig a little more deeply. What does it mean when he says he cleans? Well, I have a story for you. Stay with me. It's good. Author Bruce Wilkinson tells a story about a man who approached him at a conference once. The man asked, do you understand John 15? Wilkinson decided to be honest and said, not completely. Why? The man said, I own a large vineyard in Northern California, and I think I have it figured out. Wilkinson says he offered to buy the man a cup of coffee on the spot. As they sat across from each other at the restaurant table, the man began to talk about his life as a grower, of the long hours spent walking the vineyards, tending the grapes, watching the fruit develop, and waiting for the perfect day to begin the harvest. New branches have the tendency to trail down and grow along the ground, said the vineyard owner, but they don't bear fruit down there. When the branches grow along the ground, the leaves get coated in dust, and when it rains, they get muddied and mildewed, And then the branches become sick and useless. What do you do, said Wilkinson? Cut it off and throw it away? Oh, no, the man exclaimed. The branch is too too much valuable. Oh, no, the man exclaimed. The branch is too valuable for that. We go through the vineyard with a bucket of water and look for those branches growing along the ground. Then we lift them up and we wash them off. And then we wrap them around a torellus or tie them up alongside another vine so that pretty soon they're thriving. This is what Jesus is talking about. He is the vine and we are the branches. But sometimes we are like those low-lying branches that trail along the ground. Our leaves get coated with dirt. When it rains, we get coated with mud and mildew. And at those times, we are incapable of bearing fruit. And what does the owner of the vineyard do with us? Does he cut us off and throw us into the fire? No, we are too valuable to him for that. Instead, the vineyard owner tenderly washes us off, lifts us up in his gentle, nail-scarred hands, and places us up higher where we can thrive again. Isn't that a magnificent picture of what Jesus does in our lives? I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. 
Every branch that does bear fruit, he cleans so that it will be more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. But how does it happen that we're cleaned and lifted up? Jesus tells us, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain on the vine. Neither you can bear fruit unless you remain in me. Our holy task is to bear fruit. And we do that by remaining in constant fellowship with Jesus. No branch can bear fruit itself. It must remain in the vine. David Lose, one of my favorite theologians, sums it up nicely, saying, it's easy to read this passage as one of judgment and threat. But I don't think that's the thrust of the passage. I think it is promise. Why? Because it all has to do with context. First, the context of the narrative. Jesus is offering these words to his disciples on the eve of his crucifixion. He knows what's going to happen, both to himself and to his flock and they do not. They are about to be cut down by his crucifixion and his death, and he's assuring him that there will not be, that this will not be a mere senseless cutting, but they will survive, even flourish. Second context is that of the community in which John writes, because by the time John is writing, they will already be scattered likely thrown out of their synagogues and places of worship, having had plenty of reason to feel like they've been abandoned. But John writes to assure them that while indeed they have been cut, that it is pruning for more abundant life. Los continues, No doubt it was hard to believe, as there was precious little evidence available to the disciples or to John's community that they had not been abandoned. And no doubt, it is still hard to believe on our end as well. For so much of life simply tears at us with no evidence that it's going to lead to a more fruitful future. But amid this uncertainty and distress, Jesus still invites us. Actually, no, not just invites, but promises to us that he will not abandon us, but rather will cling to us like a vine clings to a tree so that we will endure persevere, and even flourish amongst these present difficulties. Here's the thing. If Jesus had only said, abide in me or else, that would be a different matter. But it's not. It's abide in me, Jesus says, as I abide in you. That's more than good advice. It's an invitation. It's a promise that no matter what happens, Jesus will be with us. No matter what happens, Jesus will hold on to us. And that no matter what happens, God in Jesus will bring all good things to a good end. By lifting us up, by washing us and drawing us closer to our source and our strength. And my friends, that is truly wonderful good news. This day and always. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Holy God, vine tender of us all, we come before you needing the love that you alone can provide, and knowing that within you and by you and through you, all that we need can be found. Pour out upon us today your grace and mercy. Make your spirit move strongly within us, that in our hearts there may be an abundance of your holy love. Abide in us and with us and help us to abide in you as we proclaim your glory and sing seek your strength this day. May we be fruitful in your most holy name. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is Voices United 359, He Came Singing Love. Singing. 
of our faithful response is the offering we give of our time, of our money, of our lives. In this COVID time, it might feel like the church is closed, but in fact, the ministry of this church and of this building continues, only changed. And so your offerings help to ensure that this work continues to happen. Information will be on your screen about how you can give during this time. We long to be members of the beloved community. We desire to experience God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And so we share what gifts we can laughter, hope, tears, time, talents, and treasures to do our part, trusting that the kingdom is close when we work together as community. Your offering will be received. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, open us to a new world where there is no longer least and greatest, rich and poor, haves and have-nots, a world where all are treated as beloved, precious children. Until that day comes, bless our small contributions of time, talent, and treasures, and may that work go towards the building of your new world. This we pray in your most holy name. Amen. And as we move into our time of the prayers of the people, I want to share with you something that's new to us. The General Council Executive of the United Church of Canada recently named the first Sunday in May as Mental Health Sunday. This date was chosen to coincide with the Canadian Mental Health Association's Mental Health Week, which is marked annually during the first week of May. Historically, there has been a separation among the body, the mind, and the spirit in medicine, church, and society. Western Christianity often characterizes weakness in the body or mind as a lack of faith. This notion has caused people experiencing mental illness and unwellness to be stigmatized in a place that should have offered acceptance, grace, and support. And so we commit as a church community to break the silence about mental health challenges and mental illness. We commit to breaking the stigma and the shame. We commit to removing those barriers that we might be become a more welcoming place where we can bring our whole selves, wherever we may be, to worship God and to be in sacred community together. Our prayers of the people this morning will honor this quest, taken from the shared resources for this day, created by the partnership between the United Church of Christ in the United States and the United Church of Canada. And so using the words of Reverend Sarah Lund, let us pray. God of love, we celebrate that today you are still speaking a word of acceptance, wholeness, and inclusion for all of your differently abled people. We give thanks for this church and the ways we seek to live out Jesus' commandment to love you and to love our neighbors as ourselves. On this Mental Health Sunday, we pray for people who live with untreated mental illness and who are unable to find help and cannot afford medical care. We pray for an end to the stigma of mental illness. We pray for families torn apart by mental health diseases and for families that hold on to one another during difficult times of illness. We pray for those who have lost a loved one to suicide. We pray for mental health caregivers, for scientific researchers, and for professionals who seek to bring compassion, treatment, and healing to those who suffer from brain diseases. We pray for children and teens and young adults learning how to live with new diagnoses of brain diseases. We pray for people burdened by labels and stereotypes. We pray for people who are victims of bullying and discrimination because of their disability. We give thanks for the many gifts that people with mental health disease bring into this world and celebrate the creative genius of artists, scientists, 
authors, scholars, business leaders, actors, musicians, inventors, and presidents who live with mental illness. Still speaking God, as the mysteries of the human brain unfold, we remain in awe of the intricate ways in which we are created in your image. May we be reflections of your love in this world. Amen. Our final hymn this morning comes to us from More Voices, number 145, Draw the Circle Wide. Draw the circle wide, drive wider still. Let this be our song, no one stands alone, singing side by side. Draw the circle wide. Let our hearts touch far horizons, so encompass great and small. Let our love power of the Holy Spirit, we go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ in the world. So go in peace, knowing that nothing can separate you from the love of God. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ rest upon you, the love of God embrace you, and the presence of the Holy Spirit surprise and encourage you this day and evermore. Amen. Take up his song of peace and go into the world. Take up his song of peace in every moment. 